fortresses our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing, for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and I'm task who that may be Christ Jesus it is he Lord Sabe oath his name from age to age the same and he must win the battle the word above all earthly powers no Thank you. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foul is clean. Yeah. Hallelujah. Woo. That's the Lord.
his blood availed for me. Last night, I just noticed another verse in this hymnal when I picked up that hymnal over there. And those words kind of, I mean, if, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Hear him, ye deaf. <laughs> We're going to see the deaf here. We will see the blind see. We will see the lame walk. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come. Now get ready. <laughs> and lame, ye leap for joy. <laughs> That'll work for me, brother. I don't want to be greedy. All I want to do is just see God do signs and wonders. I've had enough of dead. I've had enough of nothing happen. I've had enough of religion. I've heard enough dead preaching and dead singing. The world will not be changed by great music. I'm a singer, but trust me, the world will not be changed by great singing. If that were true, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir would have already had a revival. It will not be changed by clever speaking. It will be changed by the power of the Holy Ghost, the release of God's presence among us. I tell you, this revival has turned me every way but loose. I came down here some months ago. I thought I was doing pretty good. You don't know how good you're getting until you get where the fire's hot. I said, you don't know until you get where the fire's hot. I've read that scripture all my life. He filled the Holy Ghost and fire. I never knew what the fire was. I mean, I've only been raised in this all my life. But brother, when you experience the fire, it will not have to be explained to you. John Kilpatrick, the first time I came down here, brother, the Holy Ghost burned a bunch of trash. I, Dan Schaefer, I felt like, you know how, I mean, you, I mean, I, I thought I was doing pretty good. You don't know how dry you are till you get to the river. If on a scale of one to 10, everything around you is a four, five, and six, you don't know what it, a 10 feels like. I made up my mind, I'm gonna spend my energy and my time with 10s. I'm gonna get where the fire is falling. It affects my life. It affects, it, John Kilpatrick, that thing, it's a process, didn't happen in one night. Didn't, didn't happen in one week. Folks, you're not going to get it all in one week. I've told preachers all over the country, you cannot go to Brownsville and stay three nights or more and not come back totally changed. I mean, the fire is too hot. i got to be where the... And hallelujah, thank God. Thank God for his fire. Thank God for his power. I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. I cherish those days I spent here. I cherish it. some of the most valuable time in my life. <laughs> I, I will never be the same.
I'll never be the same. After you have experienced that, what else can satisfy? It hit me from the top of my head, went right through my pocketbook. <laughs> Folks, if it didn't go through your pocketbook, you didn't get it. It'll go from the top of your head through, right through your pocketbook to the sole of your feet. Don't worry about those who say, oh, people are just giving too much. Crying out loud, you're not going to have to give God. Give me a Holy Ghost break. Remember this, givers don't complain and complainers don't give. The word says you'll reap what you sow. If you sow into revival, what do you reap? You sow into revival, you reap revival. <laughs> no, he's going to preach. <laughs> I feel like I could. I'm not even a preacher. But I'm going to tell you, it will get on you. It will get on you. <laughs> Brother Kilpatrick was so kind, he said, you can put your tapes up and stuff out there. I'm going to sing a song from this right. Who does not have this right here? I've, I've done these Gaither videos, and they're out there too. And, and they, they're such a blessing, and they would bless anyone, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, kids' videos. I believe it's important to give them the right stuff. There's one song on here. It's, we didn't come from a monkey. That drives some folks crazy. Here, honey. Right there. Yeah, for that boy right there. And they're half price today. Take a look at those. It's right out there. Give me that next song, brother. Who can satisfy? Hey, have you noticed that, oh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute. Have you noticed that even your words take on a new meaning? Yeah. A-R, after revival. More used to be mean bluebell ice cream or something. Now, what does more mean? It means more anointing. It means more power. It means more presence. It means more freedom. It means more of God. Your whole vocabulary changes. Oh, God, give me more. Term, now you can turn me on, brother. Who can satisfy? What can satisfy? More. More of the Holy Ghost. And that word used to be. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for his power. Thank God for the river. Thank God for the wind of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Who can satisfy? like you <laughs> who on earth could comfort <laughs> love me like you do <laughs> I'm a move more faithful truth <laughs> trust in you I will trust it's all over this place Living water rain down your life on me, cleansing me, refreshing me, life abundantly, <laughs> river full of life, I'll go where you lead me, and I will trust in you, I will trust in you, my God. a fountain who is a king victorious warrior and lord of everything my rock my shelter
faithful, true Lord Jesus Lord Jesus Lord Jesus Everybody stand, please. Good morning. What a way to start off your morning with Big John Hall. Wow. There is a fountain. Now, I've been knowing Big John Hall for years. I've heard him sing all over this nation, general councils. i heard him sing in front of thousands of people. And Big John Hall has always been the kind of a guy that's uh, sort of uh, reserved and in control. Uh, really, I mean, reserved, in control, you know, um, singing in the... Um, upper crust churches, that kind of thing. And uh, here in his old age, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's just lost it all. He just <laughs> lost it all. <laughs> a friend of mine was accused, he came down here to Brownsville, and he was accused of going off the deep end. As Soon as I heard that, I called him immediately. I said, okay, I'm missing something. I thought I got, I mean, I thought I got blessed. I'm looking for that deep end. Yeah. That's where I'm going. <laughs> I hadn't really wanted to say much about it, but I can sing just like that. I just didn't want anybody to know that. <clears throat> Turn around and shake hands with about 15 or 20 people near you and welcome them this morning to church. <laughs> Brownsville people do we have here this morning? Come on, hold your hand up. Oh, it's so good to see you. I miss y'all. Isn't it great to have people come by here in this revival like Big John? Isn't it great to have people of that caliber and come through here? We, uh, we're so blessed to have them coming through here. They, they all come through, and we don't ask everybody to sing that comes through that can sing, and we don't ask everybody that can preach to preach that comes through here. But this morning, we're really blessed to have two men with us that uh, I know is going to be a blessing to this church, Big John, of course, and, and um, we have so many preachers come through here, but one man that I wanted you to hear today, this man was in the river really before Brownsville was, 
uh, he was preaching on the river. As a matter of fact, I heard one of his sermons that he preached uh, quite a while before revival even broke out here at Brownsville. He just held a meeting at Wasahatchee at our college over there and had a powerful, powerful meeting. And uh, he's a powerful preacher of the Word. And while he was here this morning, I asked him if he'd share with us today in the message. And it's Dan Schaefer from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And uh, he's going to be preaching for us. Would you give him a good hand? Come on. And uh, last week uh, we were out of the pulpit because it was my wife and I's 30th wedding anniversary. And, uh, you know, this morning she was getting ready for church, and I was just sitting up there in the bed. She got up real early this morning, about 6 o'clock, and I just looked in there, and she was getting ready for church, and I said, you know, I did good. I did good. Hair's still pretty. Almost 50 years old, hair's still pretty. Still looks good. Complexion's still pretty. I did good, folks. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm a different story, though. I looked in the mirror not long ago, and I walked in there, and I said, Dear Lord, I'm getting old, folks. Deep lines coming in my face. My skin's turning loose. My beard's turning white. I said, My beard's turning white. I'm getting old. And my pastor always told me, he said, son, most churches, especially churches of any caliber and quality, don't, don't really want a man after he turns 50 years old. That's what he told me. So I got another couple of years to go, and I'm out of here, I guess. <laughs> Y'all still want me after I turn 50? Okay. Brenda is going to be 50 way before I will, though. I mean, she's, she's coming up on it this year. She'll be 50. And I'll still be in my 40s. She'll be drawing Social Security way before I will. That's one reason I married her, because, I mean, I can kick back, you know, pretty quick. After she starts drawing Social Security, I can kick back. We can live off that for a while. So I did good, folks. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I don't know why I said all that, but I just felt like I wanted to say it this morning. <laughs> Mike Motley is here to lead into worship, but I want to tell you something, Mike. You're doing good. You're doing good. Worship team, come on out. God bless you. Join us in worship.
praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Friend, we serve an almighty God. I don't care what your need is this morning. God is greater than your need. Hallelujah. You will not believe the testimonies that are coming in and what God is doing in people's lives. You will not believe the testimonies. They are absolutely phenomenal. I've been in the ministry for, for many years, since 1971 full time. 
And before that, I was in our home church involved there. And I've never seen anything like this day. I believe unless, I, I just believe that God is going to be doing some things before his coming that the world is going to have to set up and take notice that he is still God. Some of the testimonies this past week during revival that we had, you, we didn't have to end any of them out. I mean, the testimonies were just absolutely tremendous. Just tell you one real quick. One woman came in here from Milan, Tennessee. Her husband was the meanest man in the whole county. She said the meanest man in the county. And after they first got married, she said he lost his wedding band whenever he was beating her with his hand. He lost his wedding band and never put it back on all those years. He was in the Ku Klux Klan and used to burn crosses and used to abuse the black people. And somehow or another, he, he wound up down here in Mobile and heard about this revival and just came over here to the revival just to check it out. When he came, he got gloriously saved. Not only saved, not only saved, but delivered. And he was also an alcoholic. When he went home, he hadn't had another drop of alcohol in over two years. That was 96. And to show, you how, to show you how thorough God is, he went back home and bought his wife a wedding band, put it back on her finger, and they're happily married. That's after 20-something years of marriage. Now, friend, listen. Preaching does not do that, and singing doesn't do that. That's Jesus that does that. That's Jesus. Testimonies come rolling in. They're awesome what God is doing. This is the greatest hour to be alive. Hallelujah. You may be seated. This is the greatest hour to be alive. I'm so glad God let me live to see this day. We'd like to welcome everybody also this morning in the chapel. There's hundreds of people across the street. We have a lot of guests and visitors with us this week because of the revival. But we also have, of course, our Brownsville people here today. And... Uh, in this service this morning, I want you to hear Dan Schaefer. I'll be back behind the pulpit next Sunday, continuing our messages on the kingdom of God, the government of God. But uh, this morning, I want you to hear Dan Schaefer. I believe that he's got a word from the Lord. He was sharing a little bit of it yesterday evening. And uh, as I said, he was in a river flow of the Holy Spirit even before Brownsville was. God had touched him, gave him a vision. And uh, Dan Schaefer is the type of man that if he ever tells you he had a vision, you need to listen to him because he had a vision. And uh, I, whenever he came to preach at our pastor's conference last year, I felt so highly honored that he would come and be a part of our pastor's conference because I've loved this man and uh, respected him for many, many years. Uh, I was in his church one year just as I was passing through Oklahoma City. This was back in the, probably the 70s. And I was in his church and heard him preach one of the greatest messages that I had heard, and that was on a Wednesday night. He's a powerful preacher of the Word. He's someone that I love and respect, and I want you to give a good Brownsville welcome to Dan Schaefer. Wow. I'm a pastor, and I notice when I come into churches certain things that impress me. One of the greatest things about this church I can see right away is the young people are not hanging out and lurking in the balcony. They're all right down here where the action is. Do I have any Holy Ghost filled young people in this house today? How about some Holy Ghost filled women who really are moving with God? How about some old men that are full of the Holy Ghost and rolling on with God? Well, you're in the river. Joel said it. Young men and young women, old men and old women, and all in between shall have the Holy Ghost poured out on them. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Thankful to be here today. It's a great honor. A great privilege to be in this pulpit. Now, the anointing was so strong that Big John couldn't stay. 
You notice he kept moving around so he could keep singing. I don't want to get out of the flow. I want to stay in the flow while I'm preaching the Word of God. <laughs> but he did give me a sermon title, Falling Off the Deep End. I'm going to preach that when I get home. I want to, uh, my wife is with me. I'll introduce her in a moment, but she and I want to wish uh, Pastor Kilpatrick and Brenda a very special 30th wedding anniversary. Aren't you proud of your pastor and his wife? I mean, she has made him what he is. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> oh, what would we do without our wives? My wife said to me on the answer program one time, said, what would you men do without us women? I said, we'd probably be in the Garden of Eden still. Well, I heard a groan out there. I, I built the women up and then dropped them all at once. Anyway, we're glad to be here, and uh, it's a choice honor to uh, be with uh, Pastor Kilpatrick and with Brendan, with all of you, to see John Hall again. I wish that man had learned to sing, don't you? He's been trying an awful long time. What a voice. As old as he is, you wouldn't think he could get that low anymore, but uh, I guess it's that river anointing that he's in. But he's, uh, he can take an old song and make it so anointed with the Holy Ghost until it sounds brand new. Bring a crowd to his feet. It's good to see Big John. And uh, I uh, have known John Davis for a lot of years. Years ago, I used to preach camp meetings before the hierarchy killed the spirit in them. When I started preaching camp meetings, they'd get you in the pulpit early and let you preach, you know. Then they started raising all the funds to pay off all their bills and do a hundred and other things and have committee meetings while you're trying to preach. So I, I decided I'd do something else with my ministry. But way back there in southern Missouri, John Davis was just a young beginning preacher. Were you married? His bride was with him one year. And uh, ever since that time, he's always taking time to call me and tell me I've been a blessing to him, and he's been a great blessing to me, and uh, we're so glad to see uh, John Davis again and uh, all of you wonderful folks here. I would like uh, my bride of 48 years to stand, if you can believe that, and give her a big welcome to Brownsville. Look at this. Come up here. How many believe this woman could have been married for 48 years? <laughs> I married her, according to her and her calculation, how old she is, I married her a good many years before she was born. <laughs> but this is Bonnie. She's been by my side for 48 years. We preach this gospel all over, started as teenagers. And uh, all over the world, she's helped me build churches around the world. We've preached in 60 countries of the earth, built Bible schools and built churches, hundreds of them, thousands of them. And we, uh, we just, it's been a great venture. And so I'm just glad she came with me to uh, Pensacola. And uh, tell her how glad you are to have her in your fair city. I always get the same question. said, how in the world did he get her? I gave the answer in one word, money. <laughs> if you're rich, you can do nearly anything. 
No, that wasn't the case. When I married her, we were so poor. I didn't know about, I thought tithe came from people to the preacher. I didn't know I was supposed to pay tithe. And so we were in poverty for quite a while till I got straightened out on the Word of God and learned what it is to give. And after that, we soon got out of debt, and we've been out of debt for many, many, many years. Our church has been out of debt for many, many years. How many know God's faithful to those that really stand behind his program? Amen. I want this morning to minister a word entitled, The Best is Yet to Come, or... You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Whichever title you want. The first is from Dr. Dan Schaefer. Three doctorates now. Did you know that? Yeah. You touch me? <laughs> just kidding. No. I, uh, or if you just remember me as the little cotton-headed boy and barefoot and overalls down on Southwest 23rd Street in Oklahoma City where we lived on Poor Street, and the further down you went, the poorer they got, and we were in the next to the last house on the block. The only house further down was a two-room shack with an outhouse out behind it. We turned over on Halloween. <laughs> I learned early in life. God called me to preach. I knew I couldn't. Shy, backward, introverted. I wanted to preach, but I knew I didn't have the ability. Every time I'd stand up before people, my thoughts would sit down. <laughs> Not to say I can't do it, but finally I said yes to God and totally gave it over to God and went into the pulpit with fear and trembling, and the anointing came on that I've never forgotten to this day. Now, after a while, people started telling me, you preach better than some of the older guys, and I was dumb enough to believe them. And guess what? God let me have a few sermons by myself. And I learned real quick that I couldn't do anything were it not for the anointing and the power of God. So I depend upon him today, and I depend upon you to get with the program. How about it? As we look into what God has for us today, and this summer marks my 50th anniversary of preaching this glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> 50 years I've carried this gospel around the world. And for that, I thank God. I've never found a place to quit, never wanted to quit, never tried to quit. Been through some rough times, but I set up uh, my mind that God called me and he knew what he was doing. And I said yes to God and a man of my word, and I never once dreamed that I would ever give it up. I'm going to see the end of the journey. And the next reason I can't quit is because I'm not to where I started out to get. Abraham walked through the earth looking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder had and maker is God. I read in the book of the Revelation of a city four square, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high, and guess what's in that city? The throne of God. Guess what's in the throne of God? The throne of Jesus Christ. This what, guess what Jesus Christ said to me? If you'll overcome, I'll grant to you to sit with me in my throne as I'm sat down with my Father in his throne. I've not reached the heavenly city yet, but I'm on my journey. But I'm not about to quit. Well, somebody shout hallelujah. We are not home yet. Glory. Got to get into this message. The best is yet to come. An objective look at this revival. You hear a lot of reports from the inside. Let me give you one from the outside. I'm talking about outside of Brownsville. I know some people are on your case very near in the news and everything. That's no more than a flea on an elephant's. <laughs> Posterior. Did I dress it up good enough for the pulpit? Could use another word. I'm not that holy. Please allow me to give you a prophecy I brought nearly 20 years ago during a sermon I preached about the rapture and the millennium and tie it into what God is doing in Brownsville and from Brownsville to the uttermost parts of the earth. I quote, 
the changing of the millenniums from the 20th to the 21st will be spiritually significant. Just before the changing of the millenniums, there will be a great Gentile revival as God pours out his spirit upon people all over the world. This is a prophecy I gave nearly 20 years ago. This will be a few years before God pours out his spirit upon the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, which will begin after the sun becomes black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon turns to blood in the beginning of the tribulation period. There will be a great revival during this body of Christ outpouring. Talking about the one that's happening now. This revival will come just before the seventh millennium dawns and will intensify, mark that word, as we approach the millennial Sabbath or the seventh millennium of Adam's race on earth. As the rapture nears, the world will be astounded by a period of the greatest miracles since the days Jesus walked on earth. Some of these miracles will be even greater than those reported that Jesus did while on earth as a spirit-filled man. Now, I believe in his deity. Don't get nervous. But God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and that's the power by which he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And he, his own words are why this prophecy came. I continue. When this revival has produced the precious fruit of the earth that God is waiting for, then the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and catch the true believers away. A few years later, Jesus shall come back to earth with the glorified saints, shall defeat Antichrist and his armies, and shall establish his millennial kingdom of which we shall be kings and priests. So the Lord says, watch and keep your garments and stay in the posture of readiness. There is a reason for what God has done in this place and used it as a fountainhead to spread revival to the ends of the earth. I give you my text, James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now that's been in the Bible ever since God inspired it to be written 2,000 years ago. But the fulfillment of that scripture is particularly for those that are in this building this morning. For those who are alive on this planet at this hour, specifically, he said, be established, keep ready for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I'm telling you, folks, it's real close. And that's what this revival is mainly about. I want to tell you today that you in this church, each of you, is special. The revival here in Brownsville has been called many things. It has been written about as the counterfeit revival. It has been called a flash in the pan. It's been called a short-term phenomenon. But after more than three years, it is obvious to all who are objective that this is one of the great revivals of all time unabated, where people stand in line to get in. I do not know of another revival that has, for more than three years, continued to draw people from all over the world to be refreshed, renewed, reanointed, rededicated to the call of God. Today I want to speak to what I see as the main purpose of this revival. God said in the last days there would be a great revival. In Joel's prophecy concerning the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's promised to occur just before the great and terrible day of the Lord, when the sun turns black and the moon sets in blood and the stars of heaven fall during what we term the tribulation period, there are several revelations of happenings. First, the promise is for a great 
Holy Ghost outpouring. How, who can doubt but what this is a great Holy Ghost outpouring? A person that could miss that probably doesn't have enough brains to keep his ears apart. <laughs> there are several revelations of happenings. First, the promise is for the great Holy Spirit revival. God has raised up a pastor and a people to be a worldwide dispenser of the last great ingathering of souls before the rapture of the church. Now, I can't tell you why God chose Brownsville, except to say that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Somebody here was believing, and God knew it from the beginning and said this was going to happen, and in God's time, he poured out his spirit in this place in an unprecedented fashion. Please know that you here are a special people for the master's work. It is not by accident that you as individuals in this church are a part of God's planned work. God mapped out his will for you before you were born, making you special. Listen to God's word. God has a plan for everybody that's ever been born. He knew that plan before the person ever drew his first breath, even before the mother's womb. Think of this now, the foreknowledge of God. The only people that miss out on it are those that do not walk in God's purpose and God's will. But there is no place you can be that is so full of joy and comfort and fulfillment as to walk immediately and properly and fully in the will of God for your life. Whatever your position in the church is, you're important. It takes members of the whole body to produce what God's doing here. I know a lot of people get the honor and a lot of us stand on the pulpit and people look at us and all of that. But I'm always humbled by that because the master said the first should be last and the last should be first. And I've always been convinced that on that day when the greatest rewards are passed out, a lot of us preachers that have kind of received acclamations of people and already had some of our reward will be shoved to the back and some little gray-haired widow that had been at home in the closet of prayer bombarding heaven to see revival fall is going to be summoned up to the front. And God is going to give her the greatest reward of all because God knew from the beginning the place that she would feel in God's program. We don't need everybody to be called a priest. We don't need everybody to be called to be a prophet or a prophetess. We don't need everybody to be in a position of some great leadership. We need troops out there, my friend. We need people that are solid in the Word of God that will carry on in their niche in the program of God. And to God, you're just as important as anybody else. Listen to the Scripture. Oh, Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything about me. Wow. You know when I sit and when I stand. When far away you know my every thought. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I'm going to say before I say it. You both precede and follow me. You place your hand of blessing upon my head. This is too glorious, too wonderful. I can hardly believe it. I can never be lost to your spirit. I can never get away from my God. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you're there. If I ride the morning winds to the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. Even in the darkest night, you are light all around me. For even darkness cannot hide from God. To you, the night shines as the day. I continue with this passage. You made all the delicate inward parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It's amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You were there when I was being born in utter seclusion. You saw me before I was born and you scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. My every day was recorded in your book. 
How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you are thinking about me constantly. I cannot even count how many times a day your thoughts turn towards me. You think of me all through the night, and when I wake in the morning, you are still thinking of me. Is that a great statement from God? Somebody shout hallelujah. God knows me. Has a plan for my life. God's hand formed you. You may not be under his hand now, but he formed you. Isaiah 44 verse 2 tells us, the Lord says, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I who formed you in the womb will help you. Do not be afraid. I will pour out my spirit on you and your offspring. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21, God said, I've formed you and made you. You are my servant, O child of God. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified and called thee to be set apart and to do my will. You say, a preacher, that's, t that's talking to specific people, and that's true. But I'm telling you that God is no respecter of persons. God is able to take care of everybody that lives on planet Earth. He knew beforehand who would come and who would do what, and he's had you on his mind. Oh, glory to God. And when he was on the cross, I was on his mind because God says you're special. Don't try to figure it out. It's a God thing that the human being cannot do. Then I say God has chosen you and prepared you to do his will. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6, the Lord has chosen you to be special unto him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, God chose you from the beginning for salvation, for through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and your belief in the truth. John chapter 15, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4, even as in his love he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world. And you are special when you conform to God's call and God's will for your life. I'm not asking you to get lifted up in haughtiness and pride. I'm telling you to recognize who you are in Christ. It's not your own ability. It's not your own intelligence. It's what God can do through you as an humble person that owes obedience to his will. But God is there for you like he is for anybody else. And he will not leave you nor forsake you. God will make you successful. You are special. Now a great revival produces, number one, a great harvest. The prophecy of Joel concerning the great revival also mentions that the rain will produce a great harvest. The Bible says in Joel, the floor shall be full of wheat, the vats will overflow with wine and oil. Spiritually applied, this speaks of a great ingathering of the fruit of the earth and the souls of mankind just before the rapture. Now, we live in a day when it's very popular to go to believers' conventions, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is important. But we have a thousand years to be perfected under the king of kings, but we have just a few precious years to get the fruit of the earth in and the harvest in, and we must concentrate on winning the lost wherever they are and getting them into the kingdom of God so that when Jesus comes, they'll go with us. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why God started this revival in Brownsville, a great harvest. Probably the most important aspect of this revival at Brownsville is not spiritual manifestations of people falling and shaking, as great as that might be, but what stamps God's seal of approval and validity on this revival is to see this altar area filled night after night after night after night with hundreds upon thousands of people that have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this is what revival is all about. Somebody shout hallelujah. Then you multiply that to the thousands of churches that have been blessed from here where they also are seeing great numbers of souls saved. And you see what God's doing that this has been the fountainhead for. Oh, glory, glory to God. 
It's not only what's happening here, but those who come from all over the world are returning home to preach with renewed power and faith and great numbers of people are being saved all over the world as a result. And can you imagine? I'm telling you, heaven must be in a non-stop hallelujah Holy Ghost camp meeting because Jesus said there's rejoicing in heaven over one soul that comes to salvation if that's true what kind of rejoicing is breaking out when millions of people all over the world are weeping their way through to God and coming to Jesus Christ heaven is having a jubilee let's join heaven and have a jubilee of our own blows my mind. If it wasn't renewed, I couldn't stand it. I'd blow a fuse. Makes me want to shout and dance. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God. Just remember, when you rejoice over the many souls being saved, you're just joining the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in heaven. Amen. Another thing, another thing this revival is producing is, now get ready. This is the main purpose I've come here today. The Greater Works Era, E-R-A. In John 14, Jesus speaks of the permanent infilling of the Holy Spirit. You have to realize that the Lord Jesus was the first person to ever be filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. But then when he did his works with the power of the Holy Ghost, he made that same without measure anointing available to us. And it fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And it's been falling ever since upon those that will let it come. Hallelujah. Jesus did nothing without the anointing from the day he got out of the river Jordan and the Holy Ghost came on him. And he went off to defeat the devil in the wilderness. And from that moment on, he did everything he did by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to tell you that if we are going to be anything in the kingdom of God and accomplish anything in the kingdom of God, it'll not be the might by the power or the might of men. It'll be by the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's by the Spirit of the living God. And that's what's happening in the world today. Now... But I have not known since the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as reported in Acts chapter 2 until now the complete fulfillment of this prophecy while there have been some great revivals Jesus here is speaking of something beyond what he did while he was here on earth. Now that's a powerful statement. He said the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these shall you do that's in the Bible the words of Jesus Christ which must be permanent in filling the Holy Ghost verse 12 truly truly I say unto you he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall I do because I go to my father what did that have to do with going to his father? What did that have to do with anything? He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, I will send you another comforter. The same spirit that has been with me, the same spirit that has anointed me. What was on me is going to be on you. And the works that I did, you're going to do. And then it's going to get into an era where it's greater than anything the world has ever known before. You ain't seen nothing yet. I get goosebumps when I think about it. Now, for this scripture to be fulfilled in its purest form before the rapture, it must be fulfilled in O-W. Now, I tell you, folks, it's time to get off the bench and get in the game. Hello? Now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Something beyond. Man's contrived orthodoxy must give way to God's true orthodoxy. We must cease preaching another gospel and another Jesus, whether we're Pentecostal or not. We've all been guilty of that. 
You talk about a counterfeit revival. That comes out of the mouth of people that are in a counterfeit orthodoxy. We have people that decided what is and is not allowed in church. So you've got Baptist Orthodoxy and you've got Church of Christ Orthodoxy and you've got Methodist Orthodoxy and you've got Presbyterian Orthodoxy and you've got Assemblies of God Orthodoxy. There's only one Orthodoxy that really amounts to hoops in a briar patch and that's the Orthodoxy of our founder and his name is Jesus Christ. And what he went about doing is what we ought to be going about doing. Well, somebody shout hallelujah. That's true orthodoxy. We must see a mighty revival wherein God bears us witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 11, you'll find John off in prison, sent his disciples down to where Jesus was, having a few doubts, said, are you he that should come or should we look for another? You know what Jesus said to them? You go back and report to John what you have seen and heard the works that I'm doing. The blind see, the lepers are cleansed, and the dead are raised up. That'll tell John who I am. And ladies and gentlemen, if that's how the founder of the church started the church, it's time for us to get back in to what he started to happen in the world. Hallelujah. This is the gospel Jesus preached. He himself said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Send me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. Preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not interested in a man-made perverted gospel. Jesus himself defines what the mission of the church is, doing his works and greater works than those. Some are labeling the present outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a counterfeit revival. They speak of the strange manifestation and the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating. But when you go into their churches, you hear another gospel and you hear another Jesus. There are no supernatural manifestations in their midst. Nobody is healed. No demons are cast out. No miracles are to be seen. But if we're to do the works of Jesus, it's time to get busy. Hallelujah. There is only one thing that this harlot ridden, whiskey soaked, dope addicted, pornography riddled, wicked, and adulterous generation needs, and that's the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the true orthodoxy and gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who founded this church just as he preached it when he walked among men. If he's a founder of the church, don't you think he has a right to call the shots as to what real orthodoxy is? He is the founder. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some say that miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit died out with the early apostles. But I remind them that the apostles didn't start the church. The founder of the church is Jesus Christ, and he preceded the apostles. And I'm here to tell you, he is not dead. Oh, he died all right, but on the third day he came out of the tomb and is alive forevermore. And the word said he's the same yesterday and today and forever. And what he was when he started this church, he still is today moving through the earth through you and me. Shout a little bit, I gotta get a drink. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm here to declare unto you that Jesus has not changed his modus operandi. Do you think the Savior, the creator of the world, went along one day and said, uh-oh, I've been doing it all wrong. And inserted gloomy funeral organ music. <laughs> Six foot icicles in the pulpit oozing out isms. Breathing an air of hieroglyphics. Whittling off nothing to a point. Talking about moonshine on your mother's grave. Preaching 
dissertations of oratorical eloquence on the exquisite, delicate, thin curve on the petal of a daffodil. While this world goes to hell so fast, you can't see it for the dust. I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't wake up one day and said, I've been wrong. I've got to cool it off and let it die. He's the same today as he was yesterday. And what he did then, he wants to do now. Oh, glory to God. And that's what this revival... It's all about. Now, some of you, they're saying, whence cometh this man? I saw him sitting behind the desk on TV answering questions quietly. I didn't know he was five feet and 18 inches of Holy Ghost outpouring. True orthodoxy is the orthodoxy of Jesus. The lukewarm Laodicean church of the day has put him out of the church. Now listen, how do I know? He said, I stand at the door and knock. Man with his contrived doctrines has shoved him out. Not in the church anymore, out. But he's so full of love. He cares so much. He doesn't say, well, that's the way they want it. I'm going back to the Father and let them all go to hell. He lingers outside and knocks on the door. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I'll come right on in and sup with him. I'm here to tell you, I've got the door open. Come in, Lord Jesus. We need to let Jesus back in his church. And how many know when Jesus shows up, things are going to happen? <laughs> Glory to God. I do not know about you, but I believe it's time to see visible, mighty miracles. If the coming of the Lord is as close as I think it is, and we're going to have a greater works era, we got to get to it. Not tomorrow, today. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I believe it's time to watch as blind eyes see, as lame walk, as withered hands are suddenly straightened out, as new eyeballs are recreated, as devils are cast screaming out, and the dead are raised up. I think it's time to kick this revival into high gear worldwide so this harvest will come in and then the Lord can come. Hallelujah. I'm a little weary of hearing all about super faith and seeing no results. We need all, not only to confess faith, we need to see the works that faith produces. What good is believing something you never see? Come on now. What good is believing something you never see? What good is confession without possession. What good is naming it without claiming it? Are you still out there? <laughs> what good is believing without receiving? What good is it to declare and never get there? Boy, it's getting quiet in this first church of the frigid there. <laughs> you say, how dare you? We're the ones who are on the cutting edge of revival. I know that. You're right smack dab in the middle of the will of God. All I've come here to tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. I'm here to tell you, we need to kick it into a higher orbit. Someone asked me today, 
when is this revival going to be over, you think? I said, it's not going to be over. This one's not going to end. The thing that's going to end it is when Jesus comes and the trumpet sounds and all of a sudden, we're out of here. And if that's as close as I think it is, we better get busy. What good is it to pursue and never get through? What good is it to proclaim and yet never attain? What good is it to expect it and yet never detect it? What good is it to commence it and never dispense it? What good is it to talk it and never walk it? What good is it to fake it and never really make it? Or why all the drive if we never arrive? What good is it to preach it if we never reach it? What good is it to employ it if we never enjoy it? What good is aspiring if there's no acquiring? I'm here to tell you, I'm a candidate for Jesus to walk right in and have his liberty to do his stuff. And I say to all the churches, I'm not talking to Brownsville. I say to all the churches, let us allow the real Jesus to come back in. It's time for the greater works right now. You know, the devil breathes a sigh of relief when we say, the full apostolic power is coming. One of these days, he wipes the swallow off his brow and says, I got a little more time. What we need to do in the church today is draw a line in the sand and say, devil, we've capitulated long enough. We've stood back long enough. We're here to tell you that it's not coming next week. It's not coming next month. It's not coming next year. It's not even coming tomorrow. We're drawing a line in the sand and now is the time we're going Hallelujah. Will the real Jesus come in? I'm not interested in another Jesus. I don't know about you. I want the real Jesus in our midst, and I promise that when he shows up, his mighty works are going to be made manifest. We're not preaching another Jesus. Another Jesus is not the Jesus of modern political correctness. You meet him in the backslidden churches. It's not the Jesus of modern world unless you meet him in backslidden church members. It's not the Jesus of no power, no deliverance. You meet him in most churches. But the real Jesus is the resurrected, glorified, living Savior who is getting ready to come back for his church. In the meantime, time is running short, and the church needs to become without spot or wrinkle, and the great harvest needs to come in, and yours is a generation to see his appearing, but also the generation to open the door and to let him come in in fullness of his power. Hallelujah. Do not try to change him. We do not shut him out of the church. We don't need a Jesus of man's contrivance. We need a Jesus who God anoints with the Holy Spirit. Going about doing good who heals all who are oppressed of the devil. I'm happy to report that the greater works era has begun. I can't tell you all the things that are happening, but let me give you just a few little reports. And I point the beginning of all this right here. Because when I came and saw and received and went, then we had a, a revival, a Holy Ghost convocation in Malawi where I've been working for 16 years. Charles Makawa is a little short Malawian, lives in a village, a large village, down toward Blantyre, as you, all, you go on your way to the lake, and it's a Muslim village. 200 years ago when the slave traders were running slaves out of Africa to the New World, the Arabs came down with their ships and took the African people aboard and shipped them out to sell them as slaves. But while they came in to steal people, they brought their religion in and the people bought it. 
the very ones that were selling their sisters and brothers into slavery, they bought their religion. And so there are many Muslims in that part of Africa. We've been working there for 16 years. We're rapidly closing on having 2,000 churches that we've built in that land. Built a large, beautiful Bible school there on a 16-acre campus, 21 large, beautiful buildings, many of them two-story brick buildings with tile roofs. Beautiful. They've told me, people that travel the continent have told me it's the finest Bible school facility on the continent of Africa of any group. And I don't mean that to be boastful. I'm just telling you what God's done in 16 years through one local church. No help, just the people that attend my church. It's been an expensive venture. Soul winning sometimes gets expensive. Multiple millions of dollars we pumped into that country. But we didn't go and just have big crusades and preach and then turn them loose to join what they had heard with their idols or their voodoo or whatever. We never preached except we had the privilege to build a church, a building, and put a pastor there so the fruit of that revival could remain and make it all the way to heaven. We started that 16 years ago. The president of a Bible school, the chairman of the field over there, said in my pulpit two weeks ago, he said, we have 1,400 churches here. Well, I heard that report out of Springfield two years ago. I'm confident we have 1,800, and our goal is to have 2,000 by the year 2000, which means that in every village we'll have a church that we've built. In every city we'll have several so that everybody of the 11 million people that live in Malawi can either walk a short distance or ride a city bus to one of our churches. We have literally made it possible for every living soul in that nation to hear the gospel from one local church. Do you see why you need to get out of debt with your new building? Are you listening to me? I don't, I don't want to preach at you today, but we've got about $700,000 to go. I'll do my part if you do yours. Let's wipe that debt out so that when that building is ready, you can begin to use it for the glory of God, and then your funds can go to reap this harvest around the world. So somebody shout hallelujah. That's another time and another message. So this humble man that can hardly look at you in the eyes when he talks with you. And I'd gone there and preached the Holy Ghost convocation and laid hands on the preachers, hundreds of them. And I'd been going there for years. Now get this, Pastor. I'd been going there for years, and I'd prayed for those people by the tens of thousands. We've had, we've had tens of thousands of Muslims saved and converted to Christianity, and built churches for them. They're going on. They, they know music. They're great. But in all the people I'd prayed for, I'd never seen one of them slain in the spirit or fall out, whatever you call it. But this time I went there with this new fire burning, this river anointing flowing, and I lined my preachers up there, and I began to pray for them without telling them they'd never seen it, they never knew anything about it, suddenly, pow, 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 God was putting them on the ground. All the way. Don't you get critical of what God's doing when he needs to get people still enough on his operating table to finish the job. You know, we want to just say, bless you, brother, and our eyes pop three or four times like a hail and a... I like a toad in a hailstorm and then go out and then forget everything that ever happened. God wants to get through to us. I've got to hurry, I know. I've told that lie before. <laughs> and so Charles was one of them. God put him out in the spirit, touched his heart, called him to preach, entered the Bible school, trained, and went back to this village, this Muslim village, and when he got there, the name of the village is Naisi, N-A-I-S-I. And he started a new church there, and he said, how am I going to do this? And God revealed to him in prayer that the key to reaching the village was to demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost within him and what God could really do in a tangible, visible way. 
So God said, find some people that need obvious healing. Announce it. Get the chief here. Get the people of the village present. So he selected a woman that had been blind since birth, lived all her life in that village. Everybody knew who she was and knew she was blind. He said, I pick her. He selected a man that couldn't hear and couldn't speak, and everybody knew he couldn't hear or speak. And then he told the people, come to service on a given time. God's going to heal these people. Now, that's faith. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, it's more than I got. We all worried about our own reputation, you know. What if nothing happens? What if, what if, what if, if we, we're going to what if this thing to death and never get anything out of God? And so the day arrived and the crowd arrived and he brought those two people up before the people, laid his hands upon that woman. God opened her eyes oh, that quick. Pow! And she could see. Now, I've verified this through missionaries who have been to that village, talked to the woman, interviewed her, and talked to people that said, yes, she was stone blind, but now she can see. He laid hands on the other man, and suddenly his ears were open, his tongue was loose, and he began to shout and began to praise God for the first time in all of his life. And it created a stir in that African village. And now he just completed his third church building in that Muslim town where he is preaching the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. It's time to move in to the greater works era. It's time, I'm telling you. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'll be leaving in two weeks to go over there. We're dedicating some churches and having a uh, general council and 50th anniversary for the Assemblies of God in Malawi. A, an appointment with the president who, by the way, pray for me. This could be the greatest single miracle ever, and I'm not going to tell you the details, but the man needs healing. And I'll be leaving in two weeks, and I've got an appointment to go see Charles interview these people and since that time they tell me the missionaries there have been two people raised from the dead now I'm not trying to whip you up into some kind of a big ecstasy because I know that you talk about things like that and it's not the usual thing that we see but I'm telling you that what we begin to see in our churches instead of being the exception to the rule need to become the rule we need to walk in the fullness of the power of Jesus Christ and I'm preaching to myself just like I am to you it's time that we say devil we've been under your dominion long enough and we're going to take dominion over you you in the name of Jesus and we're going to lay hands on the sick and they are going to recover and the dead are going to be raised up. Oh, Hallelujah. You say, what's happening here? Well, a few weeks ago, woman in my church developed a big growth on her head, big as her thumb, went to the doctor, biopsied it, said it's the fastest growing time, kind of melanoma. You got to have surgery. Already it's probably too late, but we'll do what we can. So she came to church, came for prayer, laid hands on her, prayed for her. The next, that night she went home, went to bed. During the night, gone disappeared she went back to her doctor he didn't even look at her he sent his nurse in to prep her for surgery so we got to get this thing off the doctor came in she said she's a humble little lady she said doctor I think you better look said it's gone he said, it's not gone. 
let me see. He said, well, I'll be. It is gone. What happened? She said, God healed me. You know what he said, Pastor? He said, I'm tired of you Christians coming in here healed. Keep me from my work. He said, I believe I'll charge the devil. Some little bitty thing, and you know, a little miracle is just as, I mean, easy for, a big miracle is easy for God as a little miracle. I had a, I went to my barber. Don't go to see him very often. Don't need to. But he saw a growth on my temple, pretty good size. He said, hey, that, that wasn't here. I said, that's ugly. That's, uh, that's growing. That doesn't look good. I said, you better go get that checked. And so I went into the dermatologist, and she set me up a, an appointment. Tom said, yeah, you got to get that thing taken care of. you got to get it off of there. And so then I thought, well, I, I'm going to go into surgery. I might as well pray. <laughs> Isn't that the way we are? We, we, get, we go to God last. Isn't that dumb? But that's the way we are. we we got to change our thinking. And so Bonnie and I, we prayed, and she looked at it and said, yeah, it's got to come off. And so we prayed, and I went to sleep one night. Got up the next morning, gone. Gone. I tell you, it was gone. Now, I'm telling you the truth. It was not there. Skin over it, not a scar. Like a baby's. Now, that may not be a great big thing because I don't know to this day if it was cancerous or not, but the ones that looked at it said it's got to come off. It looks very suspicious, but neither do I care whether it was or not. All I care is that Dr. Jesus took care of it when we brought him the case. I'm telling you, it's time to begin to move in the greater works era. Well, finally... This revival that you have started and shared is perfecting the bride for, and I've got some more little things I could tell you that have happened, but I, I, don't, I don't have time. I want to talk about one thing in closing. That's the rapture of the church. Now, I know there's a lot of beliefs about eschatology, and I've listened to all of it and read all of it. I've spent my life studying it. And whatever you believe is your business, but I firmly am convinced that when the Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a trump of God and uh, the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever. I just believe that's a literal thing that is going to happen. I don't spiritualize it. I just believe it like the Bible says it. One-fourth of the New Testament promises the return of the Lord. Angels preach it. This same Jesus that shall saw go away shall so come in like manner. Brother, if angels preach it, you can pretty well count on it. Paul preached it. The Lord himself preached it. If I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be. So you're looking at a believer in the rapture. And I think it's real close because the millenniums are about to change. Now, follow me because it's going to get a little bit tight. Jesus is coming back after a bride without spot or wrinkle. Holy Spirit filled. Stay that way. Kids, stay that way. 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Grown-ups, stay that way. So he's coming back after Someone has said what the ages has left undone now crowds the hour of setting sun. Brother, the hour is late. It's time for the church triumphant to get on the job. 
It's not time to slow this revival down. It's time to kick it into high gear. Put your foot on the brake. Rev that throttle up full open. The accelerator to the floorboard. Release that brake and let's peel rubber all the way to heaven. I say it's time to get this show on the road. Hallelujah. Now, according to our calendar, 6,001 will complete 6,000 years of Adam's race on earth and will begin the seventh day or the seventh millennium. The reason I say 6,001 is because there is a mean error of one year simply because the Jewish calendar and the ancient calendars had no zero. So the millennium doesn't really change until 6,001. And that's a fact. That's not, a, that's not something you have to guess about. So at the year 6001, we'll move into the Sabbath millennium, the Sabbath of God's work week on planet Earth. And some scholars gifted in the understanding of eschatology have calculated that there seems to be an error of from 7 to 20 years in correlating today's calendar with those of ancient times, especially the Jewish calendar. Now, they think somebody dropped the ball and lost all of that, but God let it happen by design. He doesn't want anybody knowing the precise time because he that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. One preacher said to me, oh, preacher said, if, if people knew the Lord was going to come, said they had just lived like they wanted to until the very time that he came and then gave right. I said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I believe in a rapture that is nebulous, and God made it that way on purpose because he wants us to stay ready all of the time. A church without spot or without wrinkles. So here we have uh, from about 7 to, to 20 years out here where we might have the change of the millennium. And if the rapture takes place seven years before the millennium begins, then the rapture of the church is very, very near. It's very near indeed, even at the door. We don't have much time to get this new era going and rolling, get this harvest in, but there's enough time to do it if we'll do it. Now, this means that if they believe that in God's prophetic eyes, or as they believe in God's prophetic eyes, a day is a thousand years, that God is soon to complete his first work week of six days on this planet, and the seventh day, if that's God's Sabbath, and this 1,000-year period is indeed the millennial reign of Christ on earth, then we are approximately from seven to 15 years from the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You're back seven years out of that, and I'm telling you, it is so close for the rapture that you can almost hear the rustle of angels' wings. Now listen. Therefore, what we do for Christ must be done very quickly. I believe that we're entering into the most awesome time period of God's outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the history of the church. I think it began here. I think it is intensified here, and I think we're about to kick it into high gear. Hello? Don't sit down on this. If you do, God will raise up somebody else. Are you ready? Think of it. Think of it. The sprinkles that we've seen are going to turn into a mighty rain, which will produce the final river anointing that we will know before the coming of the Lord. It is high time that we trim our lamps, fire them up, have our vessels filled with oil of the Holy Spirit. It's time that we have on the wedding garment of righteousness and keep it on 24 hours a day. The time to play games is over. We must get over being desensitized to sin and the carelessness of our times. It's time to get all of our sins under the blood and to be ready to go with Jesus Christ at any moment. We've got a job to do. Give me some music. Need a little bit of music. I'm closing this thing out. I say to you, commit your way fully to the Lord. Live every moment as if Jesus were coming then. 
Let me tell you something, kids. Older people, too. Upon arising every morning, go to the eastern window, pull a curtain back, and say, Perhaps today, Lord. I mean, expect it. Get ready. Every night before retiring, go to the eastern window, pull back the curtain, and say, Perhaps tonight, Lord, live in the state of total readiness for the coming of the Lord. It is close. And learn to pray every day, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now, in one scripture, I'll give you this text, what this revival is all about. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. Think of it. Until he received the early and the latter rain, referring to Joel's prophecy. Be you also patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. O people, the millennium is about to change about seven years before Jesus is coming in rapturing power. This revival of which this church in Brownsville is a fountainhead is bringing in the precious fruit of the earth. The harvest God is patiently waiting for. Jesus is coming soon. It is so close, I can't taste it. Now, please, no one run to the exits. I have it to stand for ease to get out. Will you stand everywhere, please, in the audience? Jesus is coming soon. Coming soon. And the little time we have between now and then, if there is time, we need to redeem to move fully into God's holy and highest will. I said we live in a desensitized age. Television has made such an intrusion into our homes until one thing that we formerly would have given our lives before we would have done now becomes everyday occurrence. The so-called political correctness of our institutions of government have weighed so heavily upon us until we've almost forgotten what sin really is. The lust of the flesh and the things that we endure and that we see and we experience and we think about. But let me tell you something, folks. Don't mess around with God because God's not messing around. God is not messing around. When he comes, he's coming after a church without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing. Mark it down. It's not how you shout here in a revival night. It's how you live the next 24 hours out here in the real world, the things that are going on. Desensitize. This generation is the most desensitized generation to sin in the history of the world. But God wants to keep you sharp. God wants to keep you pure because God loves you and you're special to God. Now, I want to say this. In a moment, I'm going to ask you, if you have sin in your life, to come here for prayer, to make a commitment to God stronger than any you've ever made before, to make a pact with the Lord that you're going to live ready from this moment the rest of your life until the Lord comes and carts you out of here. But you will confess and admit that there are things in your life that need the covering of the blood of Jesus. I'm not unchristianizing you, although you may know that you one time knew him and you walked far from him. You may just be in a state of on the verge of turning back, whatever. But anything that's in your life that will keep you from going when the Lord comes, and believe me, he's coming after a bride in white robes. That's the righteousness of saints. You need to have prayer. Now, I'm not going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I don't do that in altar calls. Because we're not ashamed of what you're about to do. We've got far too many churches that say, bow your head, close your eyes, slip up your hand, slip it down. Nobody will ever know. If you come to God this morning, everybody will know. Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my heavenly Father. And I'm here to tell you that he's not anybody to be ashamed of. And you've got a whole church full of people that love you and are praying for you. And if you'll come publicly... That'll be a confession before 
the onlooking crowd that you've made up your mind that you're going to keep the divine appointment and you're going to be ready because it could be today. We're close, very close. I'm going to look at you section by section. All I ask is that you confess first by raising your hand and say, Pastor, I need something in my life taken care of. I need some sins under the blood. I need to get fully right with God. This section over here against the wall. Anybody? Thank you. Are there others? Thank you. Thank you. These two sections right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others? God bless you. Right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Way in the back. I say thank you. What about here in this section? Hurry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you. Are there others here in this middle section? Thank you. What about here in this section? Yes, 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 yes. This section here, please hurry. Yes, all of these, all of those, got all of you. Thank God. What about over here in the final section on this side? God bless all of you. Let's start up here in this balcony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just as I come around with my finger, just raise your hands and say, I need this prayer. Come on, up in the balcony. Just raise your hands and say, Pastor, thank you. Thank all of you. God bless you. What about it? As I look your way, it's time to say yes to God. Here's what I want you to do. I know we don't have very much room up here, but we can just stand around this altar, back up the aisles, and I'm going to pray for you. And today, God's going to give you a determination that will see you all the way through to rapture. And this is what God wanted to do in this service. Come on right now while we sing. You that raise your hands or should have raised your hands, join me for a prayer around this altar. Just stand up, if you will around this altar and when this area is full back up the aisles because this is the time and up on the balcony come on down the stairs and join us as we prepare our hearts and get ready for what God is going to do real soon hallelujah what a friend I found Than a brother. We're in the harvest now. I Thank have God they're felt coming. Your touch more intimate than lovers. Jesus. Jesus. Now come on, one more time. You thought just yesterday you've got to get some things straight with God. You get yourself down here. Up there, wherever you are, you know that you need the covering of the blood. Make it now. This is going to be a special time in the life of everybody that comes forward. Sing it one more time. We'll wait for you to come. Here's what I want us to do. I want you to focus on this, that you are not just coming down here to feel good temporarily, to get over the guilt as you feel now. You're coming to make a commitment to God that this is it. From now on, there's no going back. 
There's no backsliding along the way. You're going to make it to rapture and go when the Lord comes. You've got to set your mind. You've got to set your heart. You've got to get to where you're an overcomer when you're in church and when you're out of church. When you're here where everybody's pulling for you, when you're out there where everybody's pulling against you, where the temptations are coming upon you hot and heavy, you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, Devil, I'm not going there. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to make it. So I want you to bow your heads now. Close your eyes and repeat this prayer after me and mean it from your heart. My prayer can't save you, but the prayer I pray that if you pray it and believe it for yourself, it, you will be saved. The Bible says that. So I just want you to make it now. Say, oh God, I come to you in need of your help. I cannot save myself nor forgive myself. But I believe that Jesus died for me and shed his blood on Calvary's cross that my sins could be washed away. Lord Jesus, do it today. All of them. The times I've stumbled and failed and sinned, wash it away in the blood of the Lamb. For I believe that you do. Now, Lord, I've come today to make a covenant with you that from this day on, I'm going to live right all the way to rapture. Every day, in every way, I've made up my mind with the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to live this life and be an overcomer. So I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I believe that God raised him from the dead and that he's alive right now. And Lord Jesus, come live in my heart, not just today, but all the time, every day, all the way, until Jesus comes and I'm caught away to be with him. I make this covenant, I make this commitment to be what you've asked me to be. Forgive my sin, write my name in your book, give me the power to live for you under every circumstance. And I have my own free will say, Lord, according to your word, I've done what you've asked and I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Raise your hands and praise him. Did you enjoy the message? <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated for just a few minutes. Thank you for coming. So many new faces up here that we saw at the altar this morning. Everybody can be seated for just a minute, please. Just keep your places. We're not going to be long. I saw so many new faces come forward that I haven't seen at church before or the revival. And it's so good that you came forward this morning to let God touch your life. I appreciate the message that Brother Schaefer brought. Uh, we're going to uh, change order of the service for just a moment. Now, as you know, we only have one service on Sunday. And we don't have services on Sunday evenings because we are in, in uh, this revival. Revival, of course, we have prayer meeting on Tuesday night. Revival Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And, of course, church on Sunday morning. But uh, I want to... Uh, share something that's on my heart this morning, and I know it is on many of your hearts. Before I became a pastor, God, uh, God put me under a, a man of God that had vision, and he loved people. It was very evident, and he taught me to love people and to reach out to people. And because of his compassion, I learned a lot about reaching out to people, of course, that are less, less fortunate, and of course, the lost. I saw a man that had such a compassion in his heart for those that couldn't help themselves. 
The first thing that I ever did for God was clean toilets in the church. That's the first thing I ever did for him. The second thing that I ever did is I worked with young boys in the church. The third thing that I ever did was my pastor put me on a city bus, and he sent me to hospitals, and I prayed for people in hospitals on every floor with the exception of the maternity wards. I used to go do that every Sunday. Every Friday and Saturday, I used to catch the bus, and I'd go to projects, and I'd knock on doors every Friday and Saturday till my knuckles would bleed. I'd visit so many people. I was a teenager. I could get in their homes. They, they didn't feel threatened. I always wore a tie and a shirt. I had my New Testament in my pocket. And I would go in and I would minister to people on Fridays and Saturdays in their homes in the projects. Back then, people were so hungry for God and they wanted to be helped and they wanted to be told the gospel story and they wanted prayer. And I remember going in and so many times, the little bit of money that I had, which wasn't much at all, I would see such needs that I would leave my money and I'd go home empty pocketed. I had no money in my pockets when I got home because there were so many needs. I've laid my hand on prayed for many a person in their homes and apartments. And God touched my heart, and I think those were some of the happiest, most productive years that I had even before I got in the ministry. Those were some of the happiest and most productive and fulfilling years that I ever lived because I was doing it completely obeying the Great Commission. And I know that there are many of you people that God has touched your life. You have been transformed by not only this revival, but by the ministry of this church. And I know that deep within the heart of every one of us, we want to do something for the kingdom of God. We want to minister to people. And I'm going to tell you, there's people out there today, this is such a desperate world, you don't have to go far till you find a desperate person. And they need you. They need you more than I can tell you they need you. It got to where I'd make return visits to some of those people, especially the black people. I've always loved black people. My mother was never racist, and she always taught me to love everybody. I don't care who they are. And she'd say, son, just because you're a white person, you're no better than anybody else. Jesus died for the world. And I remember especially the black people knew that I loved them, and I, on return visits I'd go and I'd knock on the door, and I remember one black lady in, in particular, every time she'd see my face, she'd just tears just come down her face. She'd say, come on in, son. And we'd sit down and talk about the Lord sometime for an hour right there in her little apartment. She had nobody. But there's people that are desperate and they need help. And one of the things that Brownsville is doing, and we have been doing now for a couple of years, is we're reaching out to our community and we're reaching out to our city. But first of all, we're starting right here in this Brownsville community. It's been pretty well covered and saturated now. Uh, we're taking items, we're taking food items, we're taking clothes. And in just a minute, I'll have Connie come, or Kathy Mack come and tell us about what we're doing in this area. But I'm going to tell you, before she comes, we need workers. We need help in reaching out in this community to reach this community for the Lord. There's people that need prayer. There's people that need a friend. There's young boys that need mentors. Um, there's people that need groceries. And you might not can go, but I know you can give, and you can bring groceries, and you can bring clothes. But for those of you that can go, I want to tell you, some of the most rewarding times that you'll ever have in your whole life is when you take your body and present what God has done in your life and sit down with those people and share with them and pray with them. It's the most fulfilling time you'll have. And I tell you, a person that lives to themselves are miserable people but a person that gives of themselves are fulfilled and happy people. And before we leave you this morning, especially after this message, I feel like this is uh, appropriate, and this is appropriate moment, and it's appropriate time of this service to do this. I'm going to have Kathy Mack come and share briefly with us what's happening in the community, and then we're going to receive an offering to help us. Now, this offering is going to go directly to this community and to the poor and to the lost in this area. It's going to go directly there. It won't go, not a dime will go anywhere else. We're going to receive this offering to help us because there is a great need. And Kathy, I want you to come, if you will, honey, and just take a few minutes and talk to these people and help them to feel your burden and catch what the vision of what God is doing. Well, Dr. Schaefer's message, sir, led right into this. <laughs> um, What's on my heart this morning, I just would like to read two scriptures to you. In Matthew 9, 
verse 12, it says, but when he heard this, speaking of Jesus, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then in Matthew um, 15, 32, Jesus says, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me and now, uh, now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not wish to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. What God has shown me is that, just like exactly what has been said today already, that the world has been trying to steal the compassion that we have in our hearts as believers in the world in general. Um, if, if through the scriptures Jesus had compassion before he did miracles, over and over you see the same example there. And I think that as God restores our compassion, you know, in the community is a place to start, that we will see the miracle start. And I would not be surprised if it's out there, actually, <laughs> as we go out and give of what we have here. We're so blessed. This is such a fantastic congregation. I just thank you all for all your giving. You know, it's, it's helped us to go on. And we have touched many, many, we've been to about maybe 800 homes in this area. And we have a presence, you know, our, our people are on Mission Street, which is a rough area over there. And we're on both sides of Cervantes here. And uh, we're there every Saturday going out and talking to people. This past Saturday, we had a new crew out there, and we were picking up trash physically. And God told us next, year, next week it would be spiritually that we're doing the same thing, that we're going to be cleaning this city up you know, spiritually. So. <laughs> so I guess what I would ask of all of you, and you're all such giving people. I know God is using this church. He's already used it to demonstrate the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart mind, soul, strength, and we are really walking in that, I believe that. And I think now it's time God wants to just open the doors of this place and let, it, let the world see the second commandment, to love the neighbor as yourself. So that's what I believe is going to happen here. I, you know, I don't know if you want more specifics. I could give you all kind of examples. I mean, we've had deaf ears open in the neighborhoods. Uh, we are, our presence on Mission Street, um, it's in Brownsville actually, but it's a little area that is just a small area, but it is so bad. <laughs> and um, there's, there's, Gambling right next to the road. I mean, these people just are out there all day, and they are out there with their bags and bottles and everything. And um, you know, they have come to the doors of this little church that we're working with, with a contribution in a baseball cap from the drug dealers to buy soda for the kids. <laughs> and uh, they've asked us to put speakers on the church so they could hear what's going on. I mean, they are really listening. They're interested, and they want—they really want God. Yeah. So, and a lot of them, a lot of them probably is intimidated to come to church, don't you think? probably feel like, well, they don't want me up there, or I wouldn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And by you going there, you can take healing with you and take salvation with you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to really encourage this congregation to contact the church or contact Ka uh, Kathy and make sure that you, that you give some time in going to this community and helping us reach this community. We, as you know, we have been given some tremendously bad press. We have been painted with a brush that leads this community to believe that we're some kind of a rich church sitting over here hoarding all kinds of things and we don't care about our community. Nothing could be further from the truth. That was just an absolutely blatant lie from hell. And the devil is trying to deceive this community into believing something that's not true. But friend, I'm telling you, we care and we are going to reach this city. If we have to do it block by block, we're going to reach this city for the kingdom of God. What came to me, too, is with the, with the whole thing about the press and all is that, you know, you don't fight darkness with more darkness. You know, the way to get rid of darkness is to shine the light. And that's what we have to do. We just have to shine that light so bright that the darkness is just going to be gone. So, I'm going to ask the ushers to come. And this morning, we're just going to go ahead and close the service with this uh, offering. But I want you, please, to help us today, would you? This is an offering. This is not tithes, but this is an offering. Actually, I guess you can consider it to be alms. It could be like alms for the poor, to help with the poor. Uh, what about the need for groceries? Uh, how's everything going there? Well, I know it's really hard to remember, and I know that your hearts are all in it, but I don't know what the best thing to do is to remember, but we need groceries desperately. The reason, we're not trying to be a food bank. We're not trying to be a clothes warehouse. We're trying to use the physical things to get to the spiritual heart. 
And that's what we need the groceries for. It just, there's no way to minister to somebody with a track when they're living in poverty and, and they need things so desperately. So the food is not to try to feed people for the rest of their lives. or It's really a way to open a door, and it works. It really, really works. Let me just do, give, can how, I give? How do people act whenever you bring them food uh, like that? Or? People are just absolutely stunned. I mean, they, don't, they can't believe that people would really care, you know, that they would really go out of their way. I want to give one example. This was actually in Tennessee, but this is kind of where I got my feet wet with this whole thing. And we were supposed to deliver a bag of groceries to a young girl that lived in a trailer. So we went, uh, two ladies, me and another lady, went to, to her trailer. And when we got there, this big muscle man came to the door. And we were a little nervous because we really didn't expect that. And he said, what do you want? You know, we said, well, we came to give groceries to so-and-so. And he said, well, that's my daughter. And he started talking to us. It broke through all that hardness. He ended up accepting the Lord. And it ended up his son was in prison praying for him because he had been saved in prison. So, I mean, just that bag of groceries. If we didn't have the groceries, believe me, he would not have talked to us. And so it really works. People are just tender, just tenderized. In fact, one lady recently we talked to, she called and she asked if we could bring some groceries. And it was an inconvenience. I mean, she wanted us to come right then. She was desperate. So we left, dropped everything and we went and gave her the groceries. And she said, do you know, I've called other churches and they hung up on me. And she said, it's nice to meet someone who's going to heaven. <laughs> so she said, so, you know, I mean, people, that, it, it talks. <laughs> Well, let me, let me tell you something, though. You know, the Bible says that the devil, as far as the sinner is concerned, is a mind blinder. For a Christian, he tries to deceive Christians, but to a sinner, he blinds their mind. You'd be surprised if they just knocked on the door by themselves and didn't have anything with them, how the devil would blind them. But whenever he sees that gift, whenever that unbeliever sees that gift or she sees that gift, somehow it removes the blindness and humbles them and opens them up for the gospel. So I tell you, friend, whatever we have to do to reach them, I'm for doing it. Let's do it. And I want to say to you, um, please don't sit out there in the pew today and say, well, I'll drop some cash or check in this offering, and I'm going to let somebody else do this. I would like to encourage you, sign up. If you can't do it all the time, there's no pressure on you to do it all the time. But if you can do it once a month or once every six months, just do it. And I promise you that'll be one of your happiest Saturdays that you'll spend. And Father, we do thank you for this offering. It's so tremendously needed, Jesus. This community needs our helping hand and they need our love. And Father, I pray that you will smite this congregation with compassion. Let us be smitten with the compassion of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, those especially that cannot help themselves, they're lost, they're hopeless, they have no light, and probably so many have nobody to even care for them. I ask you, Jesus, use this church and use our church people to go into these areas to touch this community. And we thank you for it. And Father, the offering that's given now, I ask, Lord, that you would bless it. Whether you give it back to us or not, Lord, that's irrelevant. I know you will, but it's irrelevant. As much as you've blessed us, Father, we can certainly let go of this and help the poor. In Jesus' name. Pastor Robertson wanted me to remind the people here that um, when we go out, we also invite them to come here. I mean, our goal is to bring them into a place where they're going to be fed spiritually, and so that is part of our packet that we give out. It, you know, we invite them to come. They have a ticket so they can get in early, and um, so it's, many have come, so it's, it's working. Praise God. While the ushers are continuing to uh, receive the offering, let me just remind you that we have a four-pronged attack uh, for the kingdom of God. Uh, of course, we have the revival, which is uh, self-explanatory. But God's given us um, an intercessory prayer over the city now, and uh, Lila's on the steering committee, and that's not, that's not being led by us. We organized it, but the first two meetings. But we formed a steering committee made up of people from all kinds of, of different churches that um, have joined with us, and there's intercessory prayer going up over this city every day of the week. And then once a month, we get together, and we do uh, intercessory prayer as a group, that, that group. Uh, led by the steering committee that was formed. And then secondly, we, is the community outreach that we're doing right now. 
uh, we're, we're not interested in just feeding these folks uh, physical food and clothing them with physical clothing, which we're glad to do. But we also want to clothe them in the righteousness of Christ and feed them a good balanced di a a diet of the gospel. And then uh, thirdly is our cleansing stream ministry, whereby when we get them in and they bring all the, b the baggage and all of the habits that uh, controls their lives, we can <clears throat> help them to learn tools and ways and means whereby to be delivered from those life-controlling uh, uh, habits and addictions. And then fourthly will be our cell ministry. It's, it's, it's uh, our desire to put either a Bible club, back your Bible club for kids, or else a cell group in every city block in this city. Listen, that, that may be unrealistic to do, but, um, you know, if, if you don't aim high, you're going to hit low. And so we're aiming to reach the city through the cell ministry, the community outreach, uh, cleansing stream, and intercessory prayer. And I believe God's going to give us this city. I believe God's going to give it to us. I believe God's going to give us the city. We're touching the world, but we need to win Pensacola. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a shame to touch the whole world and not win our city to Christ. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to forego communion this morning. We're so grateful that you're here. If you're visiting with us in the chapel or here, God bless you. Come back and see us again. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord bless your rising up and your lying down, your going out and your coming in. May God's grace be upon you in a special way, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.